Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences Grand Round Series. My name is Joe Saramelli. I oversee this series for our department. Uh, back in October, we changed our format to the webinar series uh, for, for Grand Rounds. And we, we're trying to do this most weeks over the course of this academic year. And we've had presentations in, in several different domains. Uh, I wanted to mention about a couple of updates to try to make it easier for participants. One is that we're, um, we have a post presentation evaluation that's sent out each week in the grand rounds announcements. We're trying to make it so that link is easier to access and so that it's actually sent out with the Zoom link in the webinar section. So look for that in, in future uh, communications. Uh, I do read the comments uh, that, that come in. It's very helpful to, for understanding how to potentially modify the series. Uh, the other is uh, we'll be trying to make it so that there's a, a link to add uh, a calendar uh, sort of reminder about grand rounds to your own calendar. So we'll, that's another uh, update for the series. Uh, today's presentation, uh, I do want to say, is, is different than usual. There's several presenters to, to highlight a, a new part of our department, but something that's been at the University of Washington for, for many years. Uh, called the uh, Alcohol and Drug Abuse Institutes. And there are several uh, faculty members uh, here today to, to present on the Institute. Uh, I'm pausing just for a minute, uh, for a moment here, to see, see if Dr. Unser has joined. Uh, okay, I'll just continue on. I, uh, I had prepared a brief uh, introduction I do want to mention that Dr. Susan Ferguson, an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry, uh, leads the ADAI uh, and is here today uh, with several uh, research scientists uh, to, to talk about different uh, projects that are occurring uh, within, within that institute. Uh, so it, I think just given the time and having started a minute or two later, I'll just pause, I'll stop sharing, and I'll, I'll let Dr. Ferguson take it. Uh, Yep, that's perfect. You can hear and see me, right? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, so yeah, thanks so much, Joe. And as as he mentioned, the ADAI. Hopefully, you've all heard, or if not, you're hearing now that we have officially joined um, psychiatry as of the beginning of this year. And so, we're very excited um, to to have joined the department and to really see our partnership. We do a lot of collaborations with, with psychiatry over the years to really you know, allow the Institute to, to grow and, and develop. And so um, basically what we wanted to do today was just tell you guys a little bit more about who we are and, and what it is we do. And I actually thought, as, as Joe mentioned, that really um, having you hear directly from some of the senior research scientists that are in our group that lead some of the main programs at ADAI would be the most useful. So I'm gonna do like a two slide introduction and then turn it over to them. So ADAI was established um, as an independent institute in 1973 at UW. And currently we have 47 staff, which include our research scientists, which are our PhD level folks that essentially act as, as faculty overseeing our grants and contracts and, and research programs. Our mission is to advance research policy and practice to improve the lives of, of individuals and communities that are affected by alcohol and drug use and addiction. And we believe that the harms related to substance use are preventable and treatable and that research plays a vital role in developing real world solutions. And we're really very committed to, um, to uh, initiatives around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we really strive to infuse these values in all of the work that we do, both internally within the Institute and then externally um, with our outwardly facing work. And so when you think about what it is that we do, you can kind of think of us um, as having these three core areas. Um, the first two you'll hear more about today. So uh, one of those areas are our uh, research programs that we have um, internally. And then we do a lot of work around education and training. So you'll hear in a minute from the scientists about some of that work. And then since our inception, we've also run a small grants program uh, where we provide uh, 20 to $30,000 grants to researchers across uh, the UW to study substance use and addiction. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our scientist, Dr. Mary hatch -Millett. We'll start off presenting and then uh, that'll be followed by Dr. Brian Hartzler and Dr. Kayla Bounce-Green will finish up and then hopefully there'll be a couple of minutes at the end for questions. So um, for time's sake, I'm gonna stop my share oh, and turn hey. it over to 
Mary. Oh, and then Jurgen's uh, here, so maybe he wanted yeah. to say. Uh, hi, I'm going to step aside. Dr. Ritter is here. Maybe switch spots. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Sorry, I had a little uh, hard time getting on this time. And I just want to say a few words. Uh, thank you to Susan uh, for talking about ADAI. <clears throat> thank you to uh, your colleagues. Uh, you know, if you think about it, in the last couple of years, I think we've all increasingly recognized uh, the importance of mental health and substance use and, uh, you know, the effects on health and the effects really in our society more broadly. Uh, and we see that in our country, we see that in our state. Uh, and, uh, you know, we have a tremendous uh, commitment in the department. We have a lot of really smart people on the clinical side, on the teaching side, on the research side working in this area. <clears throat> and I just wanna say, I'm super excited that in January, uh, Susan and her colleagues at ADAI have sort of formally joined the Department of Psychiatry. And so today we're gonna hear from them about the great work they do. And I hope it'll create a bunch of opportunities for us to work together even more closely. So thank you for being here. Sorry, I came a couple of minutes late. Go ahead, Susan. Okay. Yep, so great, I thanks, Jurgen. Sorry, I had froze for a second. We're gonna turn it over to Mary now. Okay. I'm gonna share my screen. All right, so hopefully everybody can see this. Um, so thanks, Jurgen and Susan and Joe. Um, I'm here to talk about um, the Clinical Trials Network uh, Pacific Northwest Node, which is housed at the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Institute. As Susan mentioned, it is part of the, um, the research core of our institute. And I will give you an overview first of the CTN or the Clinical Trials Network, since many people are unfamiliar with this network structure. And then I'll talk about our node in particular and highlight some of the protocols that we've been involved in over the years. Um, and there have been many years. So um, our node is led by a joint partnership with Washington State University uh, with Dr. John Rawl and I as multiple PIs. And the CTN itself is comprised of medical providers, specialty treatment providers from the community, researchers uh, such as myself, and of course our participating patients, and then the funding sponsor, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And it's really um, driven by a spirit of bi-directionality that is intended to develop and validate, refine, deliver new treatment options to patients, and disseminate that information to the research and treatment community. And the CTN started in 1999 um, after the Institute of Medicine's report that was uh, focused on bridging the gap between practice and research by creating partnerships with community-based drug and alcohol treatment. So this is done um, using very rigorous multi-site clinical trials that include uh, behavioral trials, pharmacologic trials, uh, those that integrate both um, implementation science and then uh, secondary analyses and ancillary studies. And the purpose, um, as I mentioned, is uh, determine effectiveness, not efficacy, um, practicality, and then feasibility across a broad range of treatment settings uh, and diverse patient populations. So the nodes, uh, what are called nodes in the CTN are comprised of uh, in, uh, research institutions uh, that house a regional research and training center, although we never call, actually call them that, we just refer to them as nodes, um, such as here at ADAI, uh, plus our associated community treatment providers that represent a continuum of substance use care such as addiction treatment programs, healthcare networks, primary care, uh, primary care clinics, and emergency departments. And then the CTN um, headquarters is at NIDA, um, and it is, they call themselves the Center for Clinical Trials Network, or the CCTN. Uh, there is also a centralized data and statistics center and a clinical coordinating center. So all projects that are funded in the CTN have access to these centralized um, support resources. And there are currently 16 nodes in the 
uh, US. <clears throat> this is the list, um, just in case anybody wanted to reference it. Um, but I find the map to be um, more visually useful. And you can see that uh, the Northeast and the West Coast and Southwest have pretty good representation. Um, the central area of the United States is a little bit sparse. Um, unfortunately, I think this has always been um, a weak area of the CTN. <clears throat> so one question that we get frequently um, from people who are not part of our node is how does a project get funded within the CTN? Uh, and that is a very good question. Um, it is a conundrum for many of us sometimes, uh, but the key front door to all research ideas is one of the uh, leadership committees called the Research Development Committee. Um, <clears throat> It consists of node PIs that are elected to the committee. Uh, and most importantly, it reviews all concepts that are submitted to the CTN for funding. Uh, unlike the typical NIH mechanisms, um, the RDC meets monthly and submissions are um, on a rolling basis. So you can submit on the first of the month throughout the year. Uh, all concepts get uh, peer review feedback, similar to what you get from um, a, a typical NIH uh, submission, but you get that feedback quicker when uh, within one to two months. And the RDC chair is John Rawl, um, who is the other PI of our node, um, which is a, a nice connection to have. Um, concepts are three pages, and I mention this because uh, later on I'll just talk briefly about collaboration with people, um, even if you're not um, officially part of our node. Another um, key feature of the Pacific Northwest node that I want to highlight is the CTN Dissemination Library. Um, we have received uh, special support to provide this resource for the whole network and for anybody else um, who seeks it. And this is a repository for all the work that has been completed in the CTN since uh, 1999. So it is a fantastic resource for um, articles, conference presentations, webinars, posters, um, all the research that has been produced. So it is overseen by Meg Bruner, who is our um, amazing, wonderful librarian at the ADAI. So shifting um, slightly, kind of narrowing the focus, um, I want to highlight the map of our um, node. As you can see here in red, um, the red numbers are University of Washington and Washington State University. Um, the uh, blue numbers are our associated partners that are either a health system or a medical center. And we uh, proudly have one also in Northern California, Alameda Health System. And then the purple numbers are our specialty uh, treatment providers, such as uh, opioid treatment programs or uh, a program in Spokane that focuses on serving youth with substance use issues. <clears throat> and then our node also partners with two networks that extends our reach beyond uh, the state of Washington itself. Um, we partner with the WAMI Region Practice-Based Research Network and the Northwest Participant and Clinical Interactions Network, um, which some or many of you may already be familiar with. And so this allows us to have reach into Idaho, Montana, Wyoming and Alaska. Okay, so um, at this point, I want to um, shift focus and uh, highlight some of the work that has been done over the years in our node. Um, I want to start first with behavioral trials. Um, <clears throat> there were two that I chose to um, spend time on today. Uh, the first was a protocol, um, it was number 31. I, I should say that now the CTN is up to protocol number 118. So number 31 was some years ago, um, and it was called stage 12. 
this was led by um, uh, a, a partnership between Dennis Donovan, who many of you know, um, who recently retired, and uh, Dennis Daly um, in a different node. And stage 12 was a 12-step facilitation protocol to increase connection and engagement um, <clears throat> to 12-step meetings for people with stimulant use disorders. And the study had 10 outpatient psychosocial uh, addiction treatment program sites with 450 individually randomized participants. And the primary outcome was uh, percent reduction, or excuse me, reduction in percent of days of stimulant use. And the study found that people receiving 12-step uh, facilitation intervention did indeed have higher rates of meeting attendance and engagement in activities, um, but the results were mixed when it came to days of use. Um, this project in my mind was notable because many addiction treatment programs uh, are based, designed fundamentally on the 12-step model traditionally. Um, but in the treatment community, we know that not everybody who seeks treatment uh, feels comfortable or resonates with the 12-step model, and it's not a good fit for anyone. So, or excuse me, for everyone. So in my opinion, this is kind of a weak link for some of these programs and a facilitation intervention uh, that involves a few individual uh, meetings that lay the groundwork for the first three steps of the 12 steps is a very useful resource that could engage and retain more uh, people. And these results were uh, published in JSAT in 2013. Um, the second behavioral study I wanted to highlight is CTN 47 a few years later. This was SMART ED. And it was a landmark study of screening and brief intervention for drug use in emergency departments. So SBIRT had been shown effective for people who overuse alcohol. So it seemed like a logical extension to test it in drug use. Uh, it was conducted in six emergency departments and it compared three arms. There was a minimal screening arm, um, a screening assessment and referral arm where basically you got screened for substance use and then you got a pamphlet with some treatment information and um, a screening assessment referral uh, plus brief motivational intervention and two booster telephone calls that came a few weeks after uh, ED discharge. And our node functioned as the booster call center for the national sample. And very interestingly, there were no significant differences between all three groups in days of use at any follow-up time period for the whole year. So there was three, six, and 12-month follow-up, no differences across the three um, arms. So this was very compelling evidence that even a very robust brief intervention that had the funding, the staffing, the training, the adherence monitoring um, was just not a useful strategy for ED patients who uh, presented with relatively severe uh, drug use problems. So conclusion, SBIRT, still good for alcohol, less, less good for drug use. And these results uh, were published in JAMA. So next, I want to highlight a couple of medication trials that made a significant contribution to the science of addiction treatment, again, that our node either led or was heavily involved in. Um, so first, the START study and uh, its five-year long-term follow-up, which was aptly named START follow-up. Uh, START was conducted to address concerns about liver damage that might be associated with buprenorphine and how it performed over time to treat OUD in comparison to methadone. So uh, buprenorphine is now often the medication of choice for OUD, but at that time there were a lot more questions about how it performed. And it, so the START study was uh, conducted at eight sites. It randomized um, at eight medication-assisted treatment programs. It randomized approximately 1,200 people. And uh, there was 
uh, no evidence of liver, liver damage during the first six months of treatment. And the five-year follow-up found no significant differences between outcomes for methadone versus buprenorphine. And both showed strong reductions in opioid use over time. So these studies really gave the green light for buprenorphine as a very viable option to treat OUD. And uh, here's the citation of where um, the START study results were published. Um, CTN51, a few years later, um, otherwise known as XBOT, we had a participating site in this study as well. And this study focused on whether extended release naltrexone, Vivitrol, was a viable treatment choice for OUD compared to buprenorphine. And importantly, this study, um, it was conducted at eight sites with 570 individuals who were randomized to either um, Suboxone or Vivitrol. Um, this study showed that if someone could get past the induction to Vivitrol, um, then it was equally effective as buprenorphine. But the key being that Vivitrol had a significantly higher induction hurdle. Um, that was important to know. And these results were published in Lancet. So um, NIDA also has money that comes from the HEAL initiative in addition to their general pot of funds. Um, and the HEAL initiative uh, is, stands for Helping to End Long-Term Addiction, and it's a big NIH response to the national opioid crisis. And it, um, is fun, it's, it funds nearly every institute at NIH, of which NIDA is one. So um, a few HEAL-funded studies that our node is involved in, um, CTN80, which is the mom study comparing extended release buprenorphine to daily sublingual buprenorphine in pregnant women. Uh, this is an important study because of the special population and it is an IND study. And that's happening at Swedish Medical Center. Um, there's CTN99 or the ED innovation study. Um, this is looking at extended release buprenorphine versus sublingual bup in ED patients with OUD. And we have participation from UWMC and Harborview, as well as our partners in California at San Leandro and Highland Hospitals. And then finally, 102 um, is our rural MOUD study. Uh, this compares office-based buprenorphine to um, that same plus telemedicine. It's a huge study with 30 uh, primary care um, clinics involved, and we are taking advantage of our WAMI PBRN um, and overseen by Dr. Laura May Baldwin. I think we have about five sites in that study um, currently. So Lest you and, and anyone think that CTN is only about clinical trials, um, it also does fund some implementation studies, one of which just completed. It was at Harborview. It was um, CTN 69, and this was uh, an implementation, well, it's a hybrid study that looked at training ED providers to prescribe buprenorphine to patients presenting with OUD. Um, <clears throat> Harborview was one of four sites around the country. And then CTN82, or the process study, uh, this is one that I lead with my uh, co-PI, Dr. Susan Tross, in, uh, the, at the Greater New York Node. And this is an implementation survey study that uh, is assessing attitudes and willingness to um, implement and take PrEP. Um, and also link to opioid use related services in uh, community-based organizations and STI clinics that serve people who use opioids and men who have sex with men. Uh, and it looks at patients, providers, and agency directors. And we have 16 sites in the Southeastern US that have a high incidence of HIV. So that is actively ongoing. Uh, CTN also um, 
prides itself on its focus on some certain special populations. And our node is especially proud of its relationships that have been built over many, many years with the American Indian and Alaska Native tribes and communities. And this groundwork was laid by Dennis Donovan um, and has been carried on by others in our node, including um, Sandra Radin. And both of these studies that I uh, have noted here, number 78 and number 96, um, have to do with um, understanding the barriers and patient perspectives that are um, getting in the way of bringing medication-assisted treatment to tribal communities. <clears throat> so there are many, many other studies, um, projects that are CTN funded uh, that I couldn't um, highlight here, too many to mention, um, but not any less important. We have a number of investigators involved in secondary analyses, ancillary studies, big data studies. Uh, so there is a lot going on. Um, and if anybody is interested in collaborating, um, it can be done via contacting us with a concept idea and we can find somebody in the node who might um, be interested in working together to develop a three-page concept and submit it. Um, anyone can submit a concept as long as it's in partnership with, with a particular node. Um, it could also be um, if you are seeking research partners in other geographic regions of the country, we obviously have connections to many of these areas. Or if you're looking for a particular pool of participants or a particular type of site. Uh, there are many, many um, treatment programs and medical centers that are part of the CTN. So it can really be a platform for your research. And in fact, um, this is how I um, and my co-PI got connected with some of our sites in the um, PrEP survey study uh, by um, seeking referrals from people in the UW community um, who also had worked with um, uh, treatment programs and researchers in places like Memphis, Tennessee and Jackson, Mississippi. So um, those kinds of collaborations are very fruitful. And if you are interested in um, talking more about that, here's my contact information and also um, Brenda Stubeck, who is our node coordinator and functions like the um, cog in the middle of a wheel. So she is incredibly knowledgeable about everything happening in our node. So is it a great resource too. Great, thanks so much, Mary. So I guess if you wanna stop sharing and then we'll turn things over to Brian. Okay, I hope I'm being seen there. Yep, if you wanna put okay. it in presenter, yeah, there you go. Wonderful, okay, thanks very much. Uh, so I'm Brian Hartzler. I appreciate this opportunity to contribute to the sharing of ADI research and service programs with UW Psychiatry today. Uh, as it says here, I'm currently, I'm currently a senior scientist at ADI. My research focus is on health service implementation. I'll be talking about that in the initial stages of the talk today. I'm also the director of the Northwest Addiction Technology Transfer Center or Northwest ATTC. And I'll be describing that in the latter stages of the presentation. Um, I was listening to Beatles uh, CDs as I was putting these slides together and I kept connecting the material to song titles. So I'll pre-apologize here for some of the slide titles you'll see, certainly uh, that influenced me this week. I do promise, however, not to sing during this presentation. Uh, so my own uh, professional trajectory has been a long and winding road, and it has intersected with UW Psychiatry and uh, the folks in it uh, at several points. I do want to acknowledge some of them, given that uh, some are, are no longer with us. Uh, as an undergraduate in the 1990s, my first research mentor was Nicholas Ward, who some of uh, the longer tenured department members may remember as fondly as I do, wonderful teacher and mentor to me. 
Uh, I also worked uh, back at the, in those days with Alvin Marlatt at the Addictive Behaviors Research Center, and that gave me some interaction with uh, some folks that would later become UW psychiatry faculty, Drs. Mary Larimer and Jason Kilmer. Uh, not long after that, I graduated and uh, worked with Dennis Donovan at ADI on a study um, testing motivational interviewing as means of reducing waitlist attrition for persons waiting publicly funded substance use treatment. I did go off to the University of Texas at Austin to complete a PhD in clinical psychology, but came back to Seattle to complete my clinical training. And that was at the VA uh, Puget Sound Healthcare System in the Center of Excellence in Substance Abuse Treatment and Education in an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary postdoctoral fellowship that was supervised by the late Don Kelson, also a UW psychiatry faculty member that we miss dearly and maybe many people in the department remember. Um, about that time, I was invited to uh, uh, contribute to an R01 proposal that was going to be a test of motivational interviewing training methods, and I'll talk about that a little bit more here in a moment. Uh, but when that was funded, I transitioned to ADI to direct that project. That was back in 2004. It's hard to imagine it's been you know, 16, 17 years, but I am still here. Uh, since that time, I've had opportunity to work with lots of people across campus, including those in UW psychiatry, and so a couple of, uh, a few current Collaborators I'll also mention are Aaron Lyon of the Smart Center and Lydia Chwastiak and Maria Monroe DeVita of the Northwest MHTTC. So back in 2004, uh, there was an initial foray, foray for some of us, a group of us that uh, all members of the Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers, we wanted to address the limitations of the community standard for MI training, the two-day workshop, as it had been shown in multiple studies to be insufficient to produce sustainable MI skills among most clinicians. So we generated something of a Cadillac of a training model that was focused on specific client situations that addiction staff struggled with and found most challenging. So we would send out standardized patients to visit clinicians in their workplace and complete these very idiosyncratic role play scenarios with them where they were uh, encouraged uh, and given trainer feedback about how to apply motivational interviewing skills in these particular challenging situations. We called this context tailored training or CTT. And so in this trial, this was tested in a cl cluster randomized design involving what at that time were the eight addiction treatment programs affiliated with the Pacific Northwest node of the NIDA Clinical Trials Network that Dr. Hatchmillet just described. Uh, the programs were randomly assigned to have their staff receive a two-day MI workshop or the CTT process that I mentioned, and the primary outcome was clinicians' fidelity as evidence in a skills challenge with a standardized patient. This was assessed prior to training, immediately following training, and had a three-month follow-up, and we had really, really um, high hopes for this study, and unfortunately, sometimes when you have high hopes, they're dashed, and that's what you see here uh, on the, the slide to your left, um, non-differential training effects illustrated uh, where there's virtually no difference in MI skill development or maintenance over time among those assigned to these two training methods. So we spent an awful lot of time and effort building this Cadillac of a training model and it didn't seem to drive any differently than our lesser vehicle, let's say. Uh, admittedly, I look back now 16 years, 16, 17 years later from this, and realized that probably as a group of MINT trainers, we were a bit naive and a bit training centric in our approach, uh, not giving enough attention to uh, considerations like setting variables or other implementation support activities that we now recognize are salient for instituting any new health practice. But life goes on and in the years that followed, there was going to be a, a new field, implementation science, that exploded onto the scene. And with it came new methodologies, including the hybrid effectiveness implementation trial designs that Dr. Hatchmillet also referenced in her talk. This is a generic template I'll offer, and I'll go through this relatively quickly. Um, at the left, uh, typical stages of the research pipeline are illustrated. You can see from bottom to top that we start with initial feasibility and efficacy trials. Those are soon followed uh, by tests of clinical effectiveness. They may be small or large. I think Dr. Hatchmillet provides some very large multi-site examples through the CTM. In a subsequent stage, one could test implementation of a, a given practice, uh, much the way we did in the CTT trial that I mentioned. The value, however, of that green section in between, the hybrid trial, is in, in its efficiency to address both questions 
of implementation and clinical effectiveness in the same trial. Uh, and so if you follow the graphic here, um, what you want to do is have one or more implementation strategies that are delivered to an organization or its clinicians with the intent of influencing an implementation outcome or two. In my work, these implementation outcomes have typically focused on clinician fidelity in delivering the health service, and that is the degree to which clinicians uh, deliver it as it was intended by its developers. I'm also very interested in trials typically in subsequent uh, decisions downstream about either the organization or individual clinicians and the degree to which they are interested in sustaining this practice as part of their routine care in the future. These hybrid designs also tend to include assignment of clients to receive the health service from the clinicians once trained and then evaluation of the resulting clinical impacts. And so this is just a generic template. I'm going to uh, run through, uh, hopefully relatively quickly, uh, three studies that I've been involved in that follow this design. So this first one is from my K23 award from NIDA that was uh, mentored by Don Kelson and Dennis Donovan. This was a single site trial involving a large opioid treatment program here in Seattle, Evergreen Treatment Services, maybe many of you know. Uh, it focused on implementing contingency management or uh, CM is all referred to it, and among the implementation strategies employed was something I've called collaborative intervention design. This is uh, very different from the notion of pulling a preconceived protocol off the shelf. Rather, it's a collaborative process that one would uh, undertake involving working with setting leadership to customize CM programming to address a setting's clinical needs within its available resources. Those familiar with contingency management literature probably know that it's been very heavily studied for half a century now in addiction settings with comparable mean effect sizes reported in meta-analyses for diverse protocols. So CM is really tailor-made for this kind of setting customization process. Other implementation strategies here were leadership coaching for, the, um, for, for those at the organization, as well as the skills-focused training that the clinical staff received to learn to develop this customized protocol. Primary outcome was clinician fidelity measured in standardized patient interactions. A more distal outcome was a decision at an organizational level as to whether they would continue or sustain this programming uh, after 90 days of experience with it. Because the uh, contingency management programming at this particular site was most interested in engaging their clients, uh, their new clients, in care through greater attendance of their weekly counseling visits, all newly enrolled clients were assigned to receive this contingency management protocol and their counseling attendance was monitored over 90 days and compared to a historical control group. So what did we find? As for trial results, um, clinician training was very impactful. You can see some very large effect sizes here that were maintained over time. That's pre to post training and pre to, pre to 90 day follow up. So we trained people to do this very well and they maintained their skills over time. We also saw that um, in, the day, in the 90 days after training, all clinicians who had opportunity to implement this did so. So there was 100% penetration within staff. As for clinical effectiveness, we saw a 16% increase in attendance rates for scheduled counseling visits. That's, of course, relative to a historical control group. And that equated to an effect size that's right in the range of that half a standard deviation of clinical benefit that's reliably reported in efficacy trials of contingency management in meta-analyses. Organizational leadership did choose to sustain this programming and integrated it into their routine care for at least two years. At that point, I stopped asking. But during those two years, I know that they, the organization also expanded to open two new clinics and they extended this contingency management programming in those new sites as well. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, after the CTT trial experience, this was truly corrective uh, for me in terms of uh, giving me uh, experience conducting impactful health services imp implementation research. Um, over the next couple of slides, I'm gonna present just the designs of a couple of current trials that are similarly hybrid trials. Um, uh, results are not yet available, but they do offer examples of how hybrid trial designs like this can address important questions. The first is the design of a NIDA-funded R01 on which Denise Walker from the UW School of Social Work and I are co-PIs. The health service in question is the Teen Marijuana Checkup or TMCU, which is a school-based adaptation of motivational enhancement therapy. We've worked with seven high schools in Western Washington from which the staff complete a thorough TMCU training process and then are randomly assigned to receive one of two supervision methods. 
One is the kind of typical efficacy trial procedures that we call gold standard. Lots of resource intensive procedures here to make sure people are meticulously delivering this as intended. Probably not very realistic in the real world, to be frank. The other is less resource intensive with fidelity monitoring that triggers an alarm bell when a given interventionist performance, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, when a given interventionist performance falls below acceptable standards. The interventionist then receives a supervision session focused on remediating the TMCU skills of concern. So as you can see, the primary outcome here is clinician fidelity again, and that is monitored over a two-year period in interactions with standardized patients. We're also acutely interested in the comparative cost effectiveness of these two supervision methods. And due to what was a somewhat limited number of TMCU trials and uh, questions about its clinical effectiveness, we chose to include a randomization feature here at the level of students insofar as heavy marijuana using students at the participating schools were randomized in a two to one ratio to receive TMCU or to a wait list. The primary student outcome is frequency of marijuana use over 90 days. I wanna focus on just one more trial here, and this is a hybrid design of another NIDA funded R01 on which I'm a co-investigator. Study PIs are Sarah Becker of Brown University, who spoke earlier this week to the Bright Center faculty, in fact, about this trial, among other things, and Brian Garner of the Research Triangle Institute. Um, this trial is focused on prize-based contingency management, which is the fishbowl method that was developed by the late Nancy Petrie. In a cluster randomized trial, 30 opioid treatment programs in New England, um, the implementation strategies are a common ATTC network approach, which involves training followed by individualized coaching and feedback. And that's compared to the same ATTC network plus leadership coaching for the program and pay for performance incentives for the clinicians. And what that means is that when they see their clients, uh, their, their sessions are recorded. And if they meet uh, or exceed certain established proficiency criteria, uh, they get bonuses uh, to their paycheck. The primary implementation outcome is clinician fidelity, and the primary clinical effectiveness outcome is 90, a 90-day composite measure of client uh, adherence to treatment. So while I'm not reporting interim results for these ongoing um, trials, maybe this gives a little bit of an idea of the work that's, uh, some of the work that's being done at the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Institute scientifically, uh, and also uh, perhaps uh, about the types of questions about efficacious health services that may be addressed in these types of hybrid trial designs. At this point, uh, I wanna shift and talk a little bit about the implementation services work that I lead at ADI. Just about exactly four years ago to the day, I submitted an application for a SAMHSA funded workforce development center called the Northwest Addiction Technology Transfer Center or Northwest ATDC. It was funded um, and I've since served as its director um, some might assume the transition from doing strictly implementation research to implementation service work might be simple and natural, and in some ways, yes, it is. In some ways, it can feel like uh, those things exist on different ends of the universe. Uh, as for the Northwest ATTC, uh, it supports ad the addiction workforce in the Health and Human Services Region 10, which encompasses the great states of Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. Our center provides universal targeted and intensive technical assistance, all with the intent of accelerating the use of helpful treatment and uh, recovery practices by the, by the addiction workforce. As you can see here on the map to the left, we are one of 10 regional centers. There's also a, coordin a national coordinating office and a national specialty, a couple of national specialty centers serving American Indian, Alaska Native and Latinx populations. One of the attributes of membership in a national network like this is that there are continual opportunities to engage in large scale collaborations. And as one example, the Northwest ATTC contributes to a nationally coordinated effort called the Opioid Response Network. This provides on-demand technical assistance in areas of prevention, uh, prevention treatment and recovery. And this is a pretty massive project. Um, it's uh, kind of listed there to the right here. Uh, it's undertaken in conjunction with the American Academy of Addiction Psychiatry and includes more than 40 national professional organizations as additional collaborators. It's now in its fourth year. It was recently extended for two years at a clip of $33 million, for which the Northwest ATDC received a subaward to support our regional contribution. 
speaking more uh, regionally or locally here, this is our Northwest ATT staff. We are eight strong and pictured here in a Zoom enabled portrait, as many of us do our work these days, I guess. Uh, individuals names and staff positions are listed there as well. The Northwest ATTC also employs on a contract basis a cadre of subject matter experts who provide uh, educational and consultative services for some of our projects and activities. And two other persons not listed here are Jan Schnellman and Sarah Canavis, who are technology transfer specialists fully dedicated to the ongoing work of the Opioid Response Network project. In terms of things we do, uh, one of the things we've been very active in is compiling a, a, a resource library of on-demand uh, products for the workforce. We recognize increasingly that workforce members seek resources they can access at the click of a button. Um, we do a, a number of things here and webinars are one of them. Uh, though we routinely attract large and geographically diverse audiences for those live events, we also record them and have made it routine practice to then create YouTube-enabled 508 compliant video recordings that, along with downloadable presenter slides, are accessible for archival viewing on the Northwest ATTC website. We also sponsor a podcast series entitled Talking to Change and hosted by two of my colleagues from the Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers. These podcast episodes are 60 to 70 minutes in length. They include interview, dis interview and discussion with an international subject matter expert on applying MI in unique settings and circumstances. The audio recordings along with full length English language transcriptions are also available from our website. Finally, we also develop a set of online products that are asynchronous in nature so they enable workforce members to access them freely when and where they like and proceed through the material at their own pace. The example shown here is a product informed by the K23 trial I reviewed earlier, which provides comprehensive implementation support to organizations seeking to implement contingency management. And later this year, we uh, expect to expand our library of resources by offering similar on-demand access to a set of video demonstrations of evidence-based practices for persons with substance use disorders, all delivered via telehealth modality. This is innovative and responsive to emerging needs of the addiction workforce, many of whom have now committed to telehealth as a core part of their clinical practice. In the coming months, we expect to unveil these video demonstrations. They will all center on a single client character progressing through different stages of a treatment episode during which different healthcare providers deliver stage-matched evidence-based practices via telehealth. We are also very active in intensive technical assistance projects undertaken with community partners in the region. In our first year of operation, we pulled a model to guide this work based largely on the chronologically focused EPIS framework of Greg Ahrens that's widely cited. Uh, this is depicted on the left side of the slide. As you can see, there are core tasks that are involved in sequential phases of exploration, preparation, implementation, and sustainment. To date, we've used this model in the conduct of intensive technical assistance projects for the nine treatment and recovery practices listed on the right side of the slide, most of which are complex systems level clinical practices. Given the fluid and dynamic nature of health service implementation efforts, we find this model helpful in guiding decisions, particularly when the unexpected inevitably occurs. And I will call out one specific uh, project here um, currently underway and undertaken with the Northwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center and Behavioral Health Institute, which is offering training and implementation support to three Washington State behavioral health organizations in an, empir in, in an empirically supported dual diagnosis approach called Enhanced Illness Management and Recovery. This is a concrete example of the type of intramural collaboration in which the Northwest ATTC is already engaged with partners in UW Psychiatry. And we thank Maria Monroe, in Devita, Maria Monroe DeVita in particular for this invitation to co-sponsor this important and impactful work. As a regional ATTC, it's critical for us and our mission to work with as many stakeholders and a diverse set of them in our region as possible. The list here is long, probably not complete. It is difficult sometimes to track all of the groups that we have worked with in the last three years on workforce development activities. Uh, we also collaborate outside of the region with our other uh, network partners on activities like national webinar series, multi-regional TA projects. Uh, and I recently um, also worked with a couple of ATTC directors on an NIH proposal currently under, under review. 
If funded, it will enable the development and testing of an automated workflow software management platform to increase the efficiency and standardization with which technical assistance can be provided by intermediary purveyor organizations like the Northwest ATPC. Great, thanks, Brian. Maybe we'll switch over, just there's only a few minutes left, so we'll switch over to Caleb. Sorry. No problem. Great, thank you. Um, get this up and you're good. All right, uh, my name is Caleb Bantergreen. I work at ADAI for 22 years and uh, I'm also affiliate faculty in public health and a Harborview Injury Prevention and Research Center. Give you an overview of our work, community-based research and initiatives. Um, quick on my background, I uh, did my graduate work here at the UW, social work, public health, and in health services research. I do a lot of different things, as does my team, health services research, epidemiology, implementation support, policy, dissemination, and training. Um, this is my really, really awesome team. I want to take a moment here to slow down. Uh, Mandy Owens is an early career scientist, a licensed clinical psychologist with particular interest in working with incarcerated populations. Um, Allison Newman is a health educator uh, with our Center for Drug Safety and Services Education. Anthony Floyd is a sociologist, um, is a PI on a research project and also doing amazing work with us in terms of being a project director and also helping with our regulatory work. Kelly Youngberg um, is working as a program operations specialist overseeing uh, statewide opioid treatment network programming implementation support. We're doing a large SAMHSA grant and Thanks. also helping us. Caleb? Yep. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, your, your slides aren't sharing. It's no. just on the general PowerPoint, uh, not right. the specific slides. Thank you. That would be not what I wanted to do. And try that again. Uh, let's try that one more time. How's that? Is that better? That is good. Yes. Oh, that's awesome. Good. Great. That's what I get for having nine monitors. Um, so uh, Kelly Onberg is working with us on um, overseeing a, a, a large training and technical assistance grant across Washington State, also helping us with some work with the Roadmap to Recovery, which is an alternative payment model for SCD care with the state. Jason Williams is doing amazing analytical work in epidemiology. Susan Kingston's doing a lot of project management as well as always contributing great insights on the health education side. Lisa Ray Thomas, um, also a clinical psychologist trained at the UW, is doing a lot of our community facing work, helping support networks in a community. Michelle Peavy is a licensed clinical psychologist, also working with us, um, doing a bunch of research related work. Um, and that's me. All right, uh, a couple more quick things as I get my slides to actually work. Let's see, there we go. So very briefly, our mission um, as a group is really to gather and share knowledge from research, clinical expertise, lived experience, and local data to improve policies and practices across the continuum of substance use. Very briefly, we do policy and health systems work, legislative regulatory work, a lot of work on financial sustainability, federal, state, and other committee and advisory board work. Um, I'm the, one of the executive sponsors of Washington State's Opioid Response Work Plan, which has been going on for 13 years, working with our state leadership. I won't go into a lot of detail here in terms of our research evaluation on epidemiology. What I do want to share with this group in particular, um, we obviously are doing research. We are, have a couple of research studies going on. But what I think might be most useful for this audience is a lot of research facilitation that we do that we very much invite you to join us in. Um, I co-chair with a colleague from Washington State University, Mike McDonald, some of you know, a, a Washington State Treatment Research Work Group, which we'd love to have you join us. That's both researchers, uh, clinicians, state policymakers, as well as payers. We have a subgroup right now interested in stimulant um, use disorder. And then also many of you have joined a, a new group that is a UW Addictions Clinicians and Research Group. Um, and we're always trying to get new people involved in this work. We also do program evaluation work. We also do epidemiology. We have a web page I know here in blue if you're interested in that. Um, we do a lot of work on education training, knowledge dissemination, a lot of different things. Two particular things I'll point to our website, stopoverdose.org and learnabouttreatment.org, which would be awesome for you to take a look at. And then community engagement. This is probably really the most integral part. This is the social worker hat that keeps landing on my head. 
really, um, I basically see my job is to ask people what they need, check the literature, uh, try giving it to them and evaluate it and then promulgate it. That's basically what our work is across um, this continuum here. And then within this, you'll see um, just these audiences and the formats. Our audiences in particular, I'll note, we'll note are clinicians, non-clinical professionals. We do a lot of work with first responders, community members, very important on this work with uh, black, indigenous and people of, of color of all types do a lot of work with the criminal legal system, tribes and Indian health care providers, and then work a lot with local health jurisdictions and governments. So I'm gonna stop there in the interest of time. Uh, and thank you very much for your couple of minutes of your time. Great. Great, thanks so much, Caleb, for that whirlwind. So I think, yes, there was a lot that we presented to you guys today, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of a better sense of what ADAI uh, does and, and who we are. That's that's great. Thank you, everyone, for, for presenting and uh, walking us through that, describing completed projects, ongoing collaborations, and what and what's coming, and who the people are. It's uh, very helpful to learn. If there's a question, we have a minute. And any any questions from participants that, that anyone could address? I haven't seen any come in. Uh, So, and uh, Dr. Ferguson, any, any final uh, comment or, oh, I see a question here. Let's see. Okay. I think that was just a thank you yeah, from, from just Becky. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I said, we're just excited to be part of the, um, I'm trying to see the, if there was a question, that, uh, no, just a thank you. Um, yeah, I think we're just all very excited to be part of the department and you know learn how we can collaborate with people that we haven't already started collaborations with and, and really grow some of the, the partnerships that we have. It's, that's great. I, I, as, uh, with, with a broad group of clinicians, this is a part of daily clinical work. So understanding about the research that's going on and how we can maybe do things better or reach more people, it's uh, motivating. Uh, well, I don't see any questions coming in. Uh, people seem to be very interested uh, and enthusiastic about this. Thank you again for presenting and uh, we'll, we'll stop there for today. Great, thank you. Take care.